would argue that perhaps the fact that he didn't get a patent probably allowed him to be a little more real and truthful in the way that he worked with satellites. He wasn't out to just make a bunch of money. He he was out to make space travel a reality. That was his underlying goal. thought, oh, that's a really interesting concept, the idea of a radio relay in space. And that led him to think a little bit deeper about space-based radio relays. He had a never-ending goal of making human beings a multi-planetary species. It's November 2020. And this is The Wow Signal, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. This is going to be episode 47. This is your host, Paul Carr. And joining me shortly will be my co-host, Daniela DePaulis, whose idea this episode was. Now, some of you may have noticed the intro music that's playing right now. That's A Water and Ice by DJ Spooky. That was the music that we played for years on the Unseen podcast. And it's been about two years now since we bid farewell to that particular podcast. So I thought it'd be nice to play it. And we still have the ambition of merging some of the best ideas from that podcast into this one. But, um, you know, things have been delayed a bit. For this episode, we thought we'd go for a little historical perspective. So we have with us David Skogerbo who is a space historian. And we'll tell you more about all this later. And he's going to talk with us about Arthur C. Clarke. Not so much as the very famous science fiction author, but more as the space activist. And so a bit about our guest. David Skogobo is a space historian and science communicator. He recently earned his MSc in History and Philosophy of Science from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, where he focused his research on the intersection of space science, science fiction, and science communication. During his master's, he interned at the NASA History Division in Washington, D.C., where he spent countless hours perusing the most interesting historical reference collections on the planet. He is presently a freelance writer and editor while he awaits the emergence of his first child and he hopes to soon begin a PhD and a fruitful career as a professional nerd. Hi, David. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi. All right. David, how would you like me to introduce you, actually, as a researcher, uh, historian, yeah. historian? I would I would go with historian. Um, I like space historian. And uh, I did an internship as a, at the history office at NASA. It's probably worth throwing in there as well for the for the audience. Yes. Oh, which, so center, David, which center are you at? Are you at the headquarters? Yeah, I was at headquarters in D.C., three months of my entire life. Uh, so it was a fellowship, right? Or sort of internship? It was a, it was a student internship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did it while getting my master's. Okay. At uh, the University of um, um, was Utrecht? Or yeah, Utrecht University. Utrecht. Utrecht University. And I got my master's in history and philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. So I spent a year of my life researching and writing that and a lot of that research took place in the windowless box in the nasa basement oh okay <laughs> yeah i love to hear about that actually <laughs> so that was re quite recently that was uh the date on here is june 30th year yes my internship was fall 2019 so uh -huh. i uh 
I just barely escaped the the pandemic wave. It was like I jumped jumped from the explosion as it was yeah. behind me, and I was able to still go into the office and and all of that. And then I spent the following six months at my desk. I think we are all developing a little bit of that uh, yeah. by now. Scoliosis yeah, or uh, touched even over the uh, computer all day. Yeah. Ob yeah. obesity for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here in the Netherlands, they just shut down all restaurants. It's like just overnight, they just recently shut them all down. So we've been trying mm. to order as much food as we possibly can from their takeaway services and such. Yeah. Yeah, they. I think um, the situation is not improving though here as well. Uh, we've had uh, more cases uh, this weekend than uh, the week before, so it's not... Uh, the problem is that they delayed a lot the re reinforcement of masks. That is a mm -hmm. problem. Only very recently people started realizing that using masks is all, it's at least one of the possible help to improve the situation. But yeah. David Skogobo, who just got his master's degree in history and philosophy of science at Utrecht University. And his thesis was The Godfather of Satellites, Arthur C. Clarke and the Battle for Narrative Space, Popular Culture of Spaceflight. Okay, can you unpack that subtitle for me a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you all very much for, uh, for having me. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about this paper that I spent an entire year of my life writing. So, so thanks again. Um, so my thesis, in essence, was focused on two things, Arthur C. Clarke and satellites. And it actually came somewhat in reverse, in which when I was researching for my thesis as to what I was going to research, I came upon satellites as being a very understudied segment of the history of science, specifically the history of space science. And in my research on satellites, I constantly was reminded of Arthur C. Clarke's presence in that story. And that led me to start to look a lot more into Arthur C. Clarke himself. And as I'm sure many people may be aware, Arthur C. Clarke in 1945 was uh, the first to officially, you know, at least in a scientific paper, um, proposed the concept of a geostationary satellite. So a satellite that could be um, at 36,000 kilometers above the equator, it could hover, quote unquote, motionless over the same spot. He proposed the concept, he did the math and presented it in a obscure magazine, it's buried towards the back. And that propelled him into a career as a satellite advocate. And he was very commonly called a, the father of satellites, the inventor of satellites. He's referred to this across the board through his career. And he actually came to really dislike being called the father of satellites because he says he didn't actually make anything. He just proposed the idea and let everyone else run with it. And so he conceded that he wasn't the father of satellites. He was, I suppose, you know, begrudgingly, he accepted that he was the godfather of satellites. <laughs> and that is a self-proclaimed title. And so with that being said, he's the godfather of satellites. And the remainder of the title, the battle for narrative space in the popular science, popular culture of space flight. As we all well know, Arthur C. Clarke was a popular or a science fiction author. Science fiction being a subset of the popular culture. And so he was always in this space of trying to propel space forward. He was a space booster. He was one of the big three with Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov as kind of the front line of early science fiction that had a very real angle trying to educate and actually make imaginative ideas become reality. 
And that is kind of the base of the of the thesis is how how Arthur C. Clarke advocated and communicated satellites in his work in order to carve out a larger share of the narrative space alongside the much more popular robotic spaceflight and human spaceflight that dominated the scene. So it's my best effort to do a high level summary of unpacking that uh, yeah, okay. the title there. So yeah. uh, I owe a lot to the to the, these uh, early pioneers, not just Clark, of course. I actually, I worked in geosynchronous satellites for many years early in my career. Oh, yeah? You know, so I have a personal investment in that, but there, there was, um, uh, my understanding of Clark's contribution was largely, as you pointed out, just pointing out that that, that particular orbit selection gives you this apparently stationary satellite, which allows people from very large geographical area to all communicate with each other 24-7. And of course, that that has been that has been done quite a lot. He didn't get a patent off that, did he? He just wrote the paper. Correct. He did not get a patent on it. He actually wrote a really uh, humorous short short um, piece called "How I Lost a Billion Dollars in My Free Time" in the early <laughs> 1960s. You know, I would argue that perhaps the fact that he didn't get a patent probably allowed him to be a little more real and truthful in the way that he worked with satellites. He wasn't out to just make a bunch of money. He he was out to make space travel a reality. That was his underlying yeah. goal. Interestingly, he did just present the 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 orbit, the concept, but the the underlying element there that I find really interesting is Arthur C. Clarke was a and I'll just refer to him as Clark. Some people find it a little strange when I just start calling him Clark. But when you say his name enough times, you, you, you just want to shorten it to Clark. So he was a radio operator in World War II as a young man and in the, in the um, British Air Force. And being a radio operator before satellites, you know, you were in essence working horizontally with a slight angle. You were having to work with cloud coverage, and mountains, and it was extremely difficult to ensure you could get your your communique to where you needed it to be, especially in very uh, dire situations. And so his mind was really stirring in the, how do we get these signals where they need to go without having to deal with the bad weather or the geography? And he, he claims he had read a a short story by George Smith, it was called The Venus Equilibrium, I believe, in 1943, that talked about a radio relay that allowed signals to get to Venus. And he thought, oh, that's a really interesting concept, the idea of a, a radio relay in space. And that led him to think a little bit deeper about space-based radio relays. And ultimately, that is how he thought, oh, well, dang, maybe we could bounce the signal from orbit and thus get global coverage instead of pinpoint, um, pinpointing our, our signals. And so that idea mixed with the emergence of the V2 rocket. And, you know, Clark was a member of the British Interplanetary Society years before. I think he joined in the in the 30s. And, you know, the society had to go, you know, shut down during the war. Well, they, those in the British Interplanetary Society were well aware that the V2 rocket was what was going to be the best tool they could, they could possibly get their hands on to actually make space travel real. Yet it was a weapon. It was a missile, you know, and they, he had no desire, as many of his peers did not, to advocate for the continuation of funding for a terrible weapon of war. So what was the satellite as well? You know, it wasn't just a radio relay, but it was an opportunity to reframe the V2 rocket. 
the V2 rocket didn't have to be a missile. The V2 rocket could be a taxi. And if the V2 rocket was a taxi, then you could push for making more of them without pushing for building more destructive weapons. So, oh, let's reframe the V2 as a taxi for satellites. And then the satellites could give global coverage if you just have three of them around the, at three different points around the equator, you have global coverage. We can keep building the V2 rockets in benevolent ways. And that jump-started his career at, at least the um, satellite advocacy component of his career. Did he uh, maintain an interest in, in space, well, space science and space satellites his entire career? Did he use that in any of his fiction to, as a starting point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's, that was one of the things I found the most interesting in my research is, you know, my experience with, with Clark was, uh, he was, he was a science fiction writer. He was the writer and, you know, partner in crime to Stanley Kubrick in 2001. You know, these are the, right. the flashpoints that everyone's quite aware of. But as I dug through his career, you know, the, my, my paper goes from 1945 to 1995. That's a 50 years, you know, that's a majority of his life. And satellites are the main component of his career. You know, he wasn't just a science fiction author. That was certainly his biggest MO, but he was a space advocate through and through. He spoke before the UN, he spoke um, before UNESCO. He, he was a big player in, you know, the commercial space industry. He was a go-to for speaking engagements. He wrote a lot of nonfiction. And if you read through and listen to that, satellites are the main component of his work in the non-science fiction aspect of his career. And it's remarkable just how consistent he is about being at the front lines of advocating for satellites. And that ultimately is the majority of my paper is actually not his in his science fiction, but rather in his professional advocacy in trying to make space travel a reality. Um, as you had asked, in his, in his science fiction, he actually does speak of satellites in an interesting way. You know, one of the, one of the challenges that he, he comes up on in much of his work is there, satellites are not an interesting story. They, they're, they're, a, they're a box with sensors and cameras that orbit the planet. They're not exploring anything. They, they can't be seen. They don't, they, they just, they don't go anywhere. They don't carry anybody. They're not able to really elicit an exciting narrative. And so what he does is he makes explicit reference to satellites in his work. And if you, for, for anyone who's listening, if you go back and read anything by Arthur C. Clarke, after hearing this, you're going to start to see how he does this where in much of the science fiction you'll read, it is satellites are very much taken for granted. They're a given, they're, they're the background component, you know, oh, let's do a radio, turn on the radio, message somebody, take some data from the orbiters, whatever it may be. They're seldom more than just a passing sentence, but Clark will make explicit reference to how the satellite did this very specific thing and we need to be grateful for the satellite and without the satellite this would not be possible it's and so that's how he he makes sure that his readers know that satellites are a major component of the story that without them much of it would not be possible yes uh, actually i was very fascinated in uh, hearing you david when uh, you gave a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago as part of this um, uh, roundtable we have every week uh, together with Frank White uh, um, in this uh, program called uh, Human Space Program. 
Um, and I really I was not aware of this aspect of uh, Arthur C. Clarke's work and especially his uh, on focus on satellite technology. So I have a few questions for you um, uh, about, for example, how did he experience uh, the actual uh, um, um, deployment of satellites. So, um, how how did he react? Uh, has satellite technology reacted? How how his vision of satellite changed? Do you think he was aware of the huge potential of this technology um, in terms of you know making us more aware of um, the planet? Also, we live uh, we live in. Uh, not just space travel, but eventually all space space travel seems to reflect back on Earth as well. So, um, and just a small uh, addition to your um, uh, short history of satellite, uh, the, the term of satellite. I bumped into this term a few days ago by playing an audiobook called uh, Star Maker by Stapleton which I believe is from 1934. And I was very um, positively surprised to hear the term satellite already mentioned in his book. And he refers to satellites uh, in the modern term as something that uh, would allow us to travel into space and uh, something um, um, which would uh, be in space to uh, allow us to communicate uh, at a uh, um, kind of interplanetary scale. Um, so it seems to be a very old concept also in terms of uh, modern technology. Uh, do you know anything about the, the really the, how the term evolved before Arthur C. Clarke really uh, developed it in a sense that uh, could be applied um, uh, in a more realistic way to uh, space travel, or um, you know, uh, I mean, there, there must be, there must have been a sort of evolution of this term. Do you do you know more about that as an historian or space historian? Uh, that's a, that's a very good question. So I know the term satellite has very often been you know, in reference to a smaller body orbiting a larger body, not necessarily in the robotic sense. Um, that being said, I know that when the mod our modern concept of satellites came to be, at least in the official sense with NASA, they made a distinct differentiation where a satellite would be an entity around Earth specifically, and then they dubbed new terms for the you know orbiters and and probes for example if you really consider you know zoom out, zoom out a little bit a satellite and an orbiter are the exact same thing an orbiter is just at a, on a different planet satellite is here on earth so we have made this artificial distinction as just a designation in a glossary at NASA at some, at some point. I'm not sure if that answers your question per se, but I do think Olaf Stapleton de, certainly did, was part of a, a long chain of evolution in, in science fiction and the, you know, the way in which we imagined how space would be and how, how we could actually get there. And Arthur C. Clarke makes reference to Star Maker at one point to H.G. Wells, and he is not naive to think that the satellite, the concept of the satellite, he called the artificial satellite, and I think that that very well could have been one of the distinctions too, and that it wasn't a natural satellite; it was an artificial satellite. He didn't call it a satellite; he called it an artificial satellite. It he didn't think that it was his original idea. He had been reading all of these works his entire life as well, gleaning from them along the way. So it's just a, it's a long continuum of evolution in terms of how the modern concept of satellite kind of came to be a, ro a, a beeping box that orbits the planet as opposed to a, 
a moon of Jupiter, for example. Um, it's very hard to pin down exactly where or how that may have been, but just like most things, it's a, it's a long, complex, ever-evolving thing. Um, but I think that's the interesting part about uh, history of technology for me is that um, this concept evolved really uh, gradually over time, much more organically than we think. And even when looking at the history of space travel, I mean, it really began uh, more as a um, as a human desire to travel, and uh, for you know centuries it has been um, this fictional narrative. Um, and so, uh, before it became eventually a heavily technological and scientific venture. Um, so, and when can we exactly pinpoint the start of this kind of narrative? Maybe, um, I mean, tracing back all uh, written documents, um, I guess it is still really hard to understand how this uh, idea really uh, began in the history of humankind. Um, so, um, perhaps it's something that we always carried, uh, you know, we, we, we developed quite early on in our evolutionary history. Um, so perhaps we can say the invention of gunpowder when suddenly there seemed like a way we could send our own thing into space. <laughs> that would be my, that would be my blind guess. Um, and to go back to your a, original your original question, how did uh, Clark kind of see satellites, their impact, how, the the role on Earth, more or less, is the core of your question. Um, when Clark did conceive of the satellite, as I said, he was trying to find a way to continue V two development without the missile part and to solve the issue of global communications. Those kind of two concepts come together. Satellites were just relay stations. It was just a relay back down to Earth, beam up and down. Once that concept kind of came to be, he became really very focused on the consequences of such global communications. So satellites, you know, we have a variety of satellites. You have communication satellites, you have meteorological satellites, you have navigation satellites, you have um, remote sensing satellites. There's a you know, wide variety of any way, shape or form. You can just change the sensors and you have a different type of satellite. The, the core variety of satellite that Clark focused much of his energy on was the communication satellite. That was his, his his hobby horse, you could say. And he, he claims that a lot of that came from his fascination with the idea of communicating with extraterrestrials, with uh, the idea of interstellar communication. He was always very interested in communication, which is why he found himself as a radio operator in World War II. And so the idea of communicating across vast distances was front and center in his mind. So when he conceived of the satellite in 1945, he actually predicted it would be possible by 1995. He thought it would take about 50 years because who, you know, we had never done anything in space at that point. Um, it was anyone's guess how long it would take. He hoped it would take, happen faster, but he wasn't sure. By 1957, it only took 12 years for it, to, for it to occur. And he said that that was an unbelievable, mind-blowing experience. He, he said when he was actually writing a book called The Making of a Moon that was published in 1957, actually just a couple months before Sputnik launched. And it was a, it's actually a history book. Um, he, he was a man of many talents on the Vanguard program, which was the um, US's attempt to be the first during the internet international geophysical year um and he he wrote a second edition immediately after the first 
the updates to the fact that a satellite had actually been launched, whereas in the first one it had not. And he saw it as, it, it, he believed it to be a spectacular event where we could look into the sky and there would be a star, a, a human, human made star that we had made our mark on the cosmos, that now something man-made was in the cosmos. And that jump started from 1950, 58, not 1957, 1958 on, um, a, a career of contemplating the social outcomes and social consequences of global communications. So it was space, but on the inverse, it was, it was on earth because satellites affect us here on earth more than anything else. He, come the early 1960s, he was already talking about what he called the um, nervous system of mankind which was when you would link everything to a central <coughs> database. You know, you could call it the internet today. He invented concepts like the console, which was going to be a device you could hold in your hand that allowed you to read the newspaper and do face-to-face -face calls with one another. So he was already really, you know, his science fiction brain was really trying to extrapolate what it would mean to be able to eliminate distance and to do this very thing we are doing right now, what that would mean for society. So satellites to him were just as much about space as they were about revolutionizing society. And, you know, the very interesting thing here is that the, the, the satellite to him was a, it was a double-edged sword because it could better our lives here on earth and inversely propel us into space. It was both at the exact same time. And he was very clear to point this out. Um, I think you can, you can kind of see this evolution, evolutionary arc take place as satellites became more and more prominent. He, he was a big part of pushing for the creation of ComSat and Intelsat, the um, international collaborations for you know, utilizing satellite broadcasting. In 1964, he advocated to get the Tokyo Olympics broadcast live because what he wanted to do was help create a social need for satellites because if you couldn't get people to really think about satellites, you at least could get them to need them. And that was one of his goals, is make sure everyone can't live without satellites. Because if you can't live without satellites, then people are going to yell, build more rockets so that you could put more satellites so we could have better TV and that we can have better phone service. And we can, have better weather broadcasting. Because if you really zoom out, what is a space program? It's like 90% a satellite program, 95%. You occasionally have a really neat expedition to, a, to a, um, you know, another planet. And you very occasionally have, you know, a, at least early on, human space flight. So for the most part, it was satellites. That was the whole game in town. So you needed to create a need to keep doing it. You know, if 90, 95% of efforts in space were satellite based, then Clark wanted to make sure that people kept spending money and you needed to de help develop a social need for those satellites. So communication satellites and highlighting all the ways in which they could enrich your life was, was his goal. And if, all of us sit here today and imagine, let's remove the satellite from the picture, our lives would be fundamentally different. And we would be yelling to the government to invest in another brand new satellite infrastructure as quickly as possible. That, and it's worked, it's worked. It's kept us satellite 
you know, it's kept the space programs humming. You know, additionally, in the 70s, uh, once satellites were now established and you no longer had to tell people to spend money on them in the first place, by the 70s, they were quite self-evident they were worth the money. He, 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 he turned his efforts from getting people to spend money on satellites to finding better ways to use them for the betterment of humanity. And there's a very interesting NASA experiment called the Satellite Instructional Television Experiment. Its, its acronym is SITE, and it took place in 1975 in India, wherein a NASA satellite, the ATS-6, was actually built by Hughes under the tutelage of um, Werner von Braun after he left NASA. They loaned this satellite to India, and the purpose of this was to provide educational programming to the villages of India, because in the 1970s, there was still communities in India that had, they didn't have a phone, they didn't have anything resembling a TV or TV broadcasting, it was, it was still very rural. You know, these communities had no access to education. They, I, I did, they, they had access to their own local education, but they, they didn't have access to so much of what was available. And so this pilot program that Clark was a huge part of advocating for, he actually lived in Sri Lanka for much of his life because he loved scuba diving, but that's a, that's a whole other story of this interesting man. Um, he was at the front lines of helping India learn how to develop their own satellite space program using a NASA satellite to teach them and then to beam educational programming on family planning and agriculture and um, so on and so forth into rural villages as a as a way to showcase how satellites can enrich the developing world. And that very much came to be the case. I mean, if you look at any photo of the developing world in the 1980s, it's just rows, apartment blocks of every single balcony has a satellite dish. You know, it did not take very long for it to proliferate everywhere. Um, and so he, you know, he, he really did see satellites as a way to improve the human condition while simultaneously ensuring that satellites, that space programs and uh, the ultimate goal of space travel always had people who needed those space programs. Yeah, we're going back to the, the fiber optics and the, the wires of, of old days. Did Clark, yeah, he foresaw a lot of things. Did he foresee the internet? Yeah, in many ways he did. He called it the nervous system of mankind in the 60s, and he talked about a central human library in which everyone could access it via your console. So in, in a roundabout way, yes, he, he foresaw smartphones and, and, and data on the internet Wikipedia. in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he very much did. But if you really think, if you're, if you're on the, you know, trying to contemplate the future and your whole, your whole realm is the passing of information, you know, is about beaming direct, you know, direct broadcasting. So I'm going to send a signal directly to your TV with this, with a program. It just, it, it seems like the natural next step to imagine that it would no longer be the box, but rather the box in your room, it would be the box in your hand. And that, that information then would, would grow in, in, uh, in, in number. Right. Uh, how did Clark feel about the, the, uh, the human space program like Apollo and space shuttle, did he, was he a big advocate? Oh yeah. 
Absolutely. He uh, he was actually sitting next to Walter Cronkite and um, Heinlein in for the Apollo 11 live broadcast. So that's a very prominent spot in the uh, in the um, space space lovers group, you could say. Ah, uh, I was too young to know who who he was back then, but I, I probably did see that. But uh, he he. And he so was a big fan. We sometimes tend to overemphasize the negative results of lots of global communication. We have a lot more of it than we used to, thanks to the digital revolution, fiber optics. But did he have any kind of warnings for us? Yeah, sure. So he definitely foresaw the risk of using communication satellites to broadcast propaganda. And he, he was quite explicit about that. He actually wrote a, a story in Playboy, I think, in the early 1960s. He wrote a lot in Playboy. He, he was a friend of Hugh Hefner, in fact, and wrote like 40 stories for Playboy, interestingly. Hmm. Um, and in one of them, he wrote a fictional story about a TV executive who... It, well, there's there's multiple ones. I'm actually mixing them up, but the one I the one I want to actually reference is a, the Chinese were going to use through a TV executive TV broadcasting to send porn and and just sinful things into American society to unravel it from underneath in order to weaken our society. So this the the idea of using satellites to to beam terrible things. Interestingly, he wrote this in Playboy, um, <laughs> but he he definitely saw the the risk of of uh, propaganda and misinformation, and he did express this out loud. But he also was very clear that he felt that, and this is a very common thread for him throughout all of his works, uh, it, especially regarding satellites, is that the, the pros always outweighed the cons. The good outweighed the bad. Good would defeat evil. So yes, there's going to be propaganda, but the populace is going to be so much more educated because of all this information that they're going to be able to see through it. And that the dictators who try to oppress their people, maybe using this propaganda, are going to be defeated because they are going to be seen because of these communication satellites. You can, he has a really interesting quote, you can, you can shoot the cameraman, but that's going to, you're going to be killed because you shot the cameraman because we have it on tape and the video of you killing the cameraman has been beamed to Los Angeles and it's stored there. There's no way you can escape the truth. It's right there. The, the, the global infrastructure has, has caught you red handed and you can't lie with what you see with your eyes. So the good outweighs the bad. Um, that being said, aside from communications, there was two other areas that he really was quite focused on the, what he was worried about. And that was, um, space junk, and I think that that's something that we're all we're all very aware of. Those of us who are, you know, privy to the the nature of space, and perhaps the those who might not know the the Kessler syndrome. The Kessler syndrome is a was a 1977 paper written by a gentleman named Kessler, and I, I forget his co-author. And the whole concept is about a cascade effect of space junk, where you have two collisions that creates a bunch of junk, you know, in essence, 10,000 bullets of shrapnel in all directions. One of those hits another satellite, one of those hits another satellite, and eventually you have so many bullets in so many different directions that every single satellite gets destroyed and we live under a haze of debris that then keeps us from ever being able to go into space again. And of course he was 
very focused on this because satellites were the, the central component of such a future. There's a 1979 book he wrote called The Fountains of Paradise, where he introduces the concept of the space elevator, mm -hmm. which of course is a satellite-based infrastructure. <laughs> it's a satellite with a tether attached to it. Satellites are always a centerpiece here. If you notice a theme. And in the book, he, he has a whole chapter on Operation Cleanup, which is a, a whole endeavor that humanity had to go through to clean up the, the band of debris caused from all of their past mistakes. And it is used lasers to shoot, shoot all of the debris down. So again, he thinks that human beings can likely resolve that with their own, in, with their own savviness, you could say. But that doesn't mean that he just writes it off. There's, there is a very, very distinct part of his career in the early 1980s during the Reagan administration and Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And the centerpiece of the Strategic Defense Initiative was satellite weapons, anti-satellite weapons. You know, Russia wants to destroy our satellite. So we need to be able to destroy their satellite. And then we need to equip satellites with the capacity to use lasers to shoot down nuclear missiles before they ever reach our soil. So this, he was avidly against the Strategic Defense Initiative because what would it do? It would create a space junk catastrophe. It would militarize space. It would jeopardize the entire satellite infrastructure in the first place. So he just, he was on the offensive to, to nip that in the bud and keep such a, such a future from happening. He wanted to keep things in the realm of commercial enterprise and civilian space programs and keep it, keep, keep weapons out of space because space junk was a, was a very real risk that he, wanted to circumvent. Um, and then lastly, he was very aware of the risk of uh, the loss of the night sky and uh, the, light, the lights that might disrupt radio astronomy. And especially come the late 80s and early 90s, you had thing, initiatives like Iridium and low orbit Comsats, and there was already an uproar. You know, these things seem like modern day issues. You know, we have Starlink, and that's disrupting astronomers' observations and such. But these were things that were happening in the 90s as well. And he didn't like it that that was possible. But interestingly, he thought, well, radio astronomers, you'll just have to put your telescopes on the moon because satellites are not going to go anywhere they we need them too much now by the by the late 80s early 90s he's like sorry guys <laughs> these things are here to stay and their people are starting to invest so much money in the private industry that's good for the ultimate goal of getting into space so we're just going to have to accept it you know that is definitely an open debate as to whether he was whose side you're on I, i'd say we're we're all in this muddled mess. Daniel, do you have anything else you'd like to ask, David, before we wrap it up? Yes, I know, David, you spent um, uh, quite a long time working on your uh, research on uh, Arthur C. Clarke, and uh, you had an internship at NASA to develop this research. What is the most remarkable thing that... Um, about his work that really caught your attention that you haven't mentioned in our conversation yet? Ooh, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's a very good question. I would, I would say that I took, I took his work, I, I, seeing it from the whole of his career, the level of of intensity to just make make it happen he had a never-ending goal 
of making human beings a multi-planetary species that never wavered despite all that changed between you know the 30s through to when he died in 2008 he never thought it was impossible he always he always knew that is what i want to make happen but he was remarkably adaptable and he just, he really went he really went with the flow and i i was inspired uh, you know as a as, as a as a space communicator a space historian someone who also wants to see humans as, as a multiplanetary species i feel that he gave me a very good lesson in being highly highly adaptable to what is before you without forgetting the the ultimate goal he he was not an alarmist he was very optimistic and he he just never wavered from his from his passion despite so much changing over the course of his career it was hyper focused yet a me meandering river you could say anything else you wanted what wanted to take away with from this conversation david before we wrap it up i suppose i to all those who are fascinated with space and who can't get enough of um human space flight, visiting Pluto, New Horizons, these types of missions, to not forget about the little beeping boxes that orbit our planet, because they really are life-changing entities that our entire society depends upon, and they are the majority of space programs, and they deserve more of our attention, because with all the bad, there, with all the good, there is the bad, and the more we are aware, the better. And there's a stark lack of awareness when it comes to satellites with, with most people, even those who are very fascinated with space, who might be very privy to its developments. So I would advise people to take Arthur C. Clarke's advice and to make sure that they hold a greater share of your mental space when it comes to space. Okay, well, great. Good. That's a good place to leave it, David. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. It was great okay. to talk to you tonight. Well, Thank you so much. This is great. Good night, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Till next time, Paul, for bye -bye. our next podcast. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. thanks once again to David Skogerbo and Danielle DePaulis for joining me in that conversation. You can find all the information you want about the topics we discuss in this podcast at wowsignalpodcast.com. Again, this is episode 47. It's 47. And Coming up fairly soon when it will be episode 48. I don't have all the details yet, but I think it's going to be real interesting. And we have other people and we have some more bursts that are at least planned. Whether we put them out at any particular schedule is um, hit or miss. I have to apologize. I am the sort of person whose time management gets easily train wrecked by little things like global pandemics. And so uh, the shift to working from home and having the children home while they're normally in school has been tricky for me, but I'm starting to adjust better now and getting some perspective. So um, thanks to Daniela for kind of rousing me out of my slumber as far as the podcast goes. So uh, I think I'll skip the begging and nagging segment uh, just please uh, 
subscribe to the podcast if you if you like what you hear here there's gonna be more of it and just take your whatever your favorite podcatcher is just click subscribe on that and you'll get every episode coming up we don't we, we typically put out about when we're on, we're on a roll about two episodes a month and maybe one or two bursts a month but that's it's irregular we don't try to hit a regular schedule and uh, so it's out when it's out it's ready when it's ready and that way we never have, we never have to give you filler content it's always stuff that we feel really should be out there and so I will see you again soon uh, my name is Paul Carr and this is the Wow Signal and it's production of the Dream of the Open Channel it is produced and distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. The music for this episode was by DJ Spooky and Lloyd Rogers.